At the end of the bar was this like vision of loveliness, like this platinum mullet yeah, with yeah. The black nails and porcelain skin and yeah. curvy figure. And, um, you know, they were all like what, drawing straws. Who was going to go up and say hello, right? So she turns and it's Vince Neil of Motley Crue. And then Steven said, ooh, that dude looks like a lady. That dude looks like a lady. Dude looks like a lady. And that was the birth of Dude Looks Like a Lady. That's awesome. They say that lightning doesn't strike twice. But when you work with Desmond Child, it often does. He's a bona fide hit maker, a music legend, and has produced, written, or co-written some of the biggest songs in mock history. Kiss. Bon Jovi, Joan Jett, Aerosmith, Cher, Alice Cooper, Katy Perry, and Ricky Martin are just a few names he's worked with. He's a Grammy-winning producer inductee into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, chairman CEO of the Latin Songwriters Hall of Fame, and board member of the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers. Desmond understands how to excavate motions helping artists to evolve and create songs with depth, beauty, and feel. Steven Tyler said, the first time we met, we wrote Angel in about an hour and 45 minutes, and I'm not bullshitting. The guy's a fucking genius. And Cher said, he only knows how to write one kind of song, a hit. When working with these iconic artists, Desmond created some of their most memorable tracks and has had multiple Billboard Top 100 songs in his solo career. Here are just some of the incredible songs he brought to life. Bon Jovi, Living on a Prayer, You Give Love a Bad Name, Bad Medicine, Born to Be My Baby. God, I've heard those songs a million times. Aerosmith, Dude Like a Lady, Crazy, Angel, Joan Jett, I Hate Myself for Loving You. What a great title. Kiss, I Was Made for Loving You, super hit. Ricky Martin, Living La Vida Loca, the Shake Your Bomb Bomb, which I recorded. And finally, Alice Cooper's Poison. I love working with Desmond because every note, beat, crash, or drum fill that I play has to have purpose and passion so the listener will feel something they've never felt before. People are feeling creatures, and Desmond understands that perfectly. He's passionate about everything he does, which makes him unstoppable, undeniable, and 100% authentic. 1,000% authentic. Desmond recently released a tell-all new book called Living on a Prayer, Big Songs, Big Life, a memoir recounting his incredible journey throughout a storied career in music. Des, I haven't finished your book yet, but what I have read is amazing. Last night I was up reading The Meatloaf, chapter which I recorded that record with you. I had no idea some of the things that went on between you and me. You're talking about the music business and a time in my life I have lived through. I know most of the artists and bands and the people you've worked with, not to mention the ones you hired me to be part of. Your journey is so unique from the backstory of where and how you grew up, your personal relationship with your family and friends as a child, your education, your career, and your life experiences. So obviously, your story is very unique. So Des, why did you write this book now? Well, I didn't write it now. I started it seven years ago. Oh. <laughs> but the thing was that it really became what I call my se seven-year jailhouse confession, um, a real reckoning of my life. And it was, it was very hard to go backwards. I'm a total forward falling person <laughs> and going back, um, you know, was very difficult, painful. And I also realized that I had rewritten a lot of those stories in my mind, you know, to be able to live with them. And so now I had to really tell the truth. And one of my main motivations was that my husband and I, um, have twin sons. I know you're a twin. Yeah. And um, I wanted them to know me inside and out. Like, I didn't just want to be daddy with the open checkbook. And, you know, I've been a studio rat my whole life. So mm -hmm. 
when I come home, they were asleep. When I wake up, they were already gone to school. And we were lucky if I didn't have to work through the weekend. I, I mean, that's how hard I've worked to make the life that we have. And so, you know, I just felt like, well, maybe someday they'll take that book, they'll open it. I may not be around anymore, but they'll hear my voice and they'll, they'll feel me. That's amazing, man. We should just end the whole thing right now. That was perfect. That's like so, so cool, man. Boy, I can relate to so many things you said, man. I was gone all the time too, man. It's like, and the working hard thing. I mean, you know, I have a phrase that goes, I'll never be as great as I want to be, but I'm willing to spend the rest of my life trying to be as great as I can be. I mean, just rolling forward like a, it's like a running back. They just keep trying to get touchdowns. They don't do it every time but they just are wired that way. You, you play by play, game by game, season by season. Sometimes it's touchdown, sometimes five yards, two yards, minus two, fumble, break your leg, and you're out for the season. They keep trying to march, because they love what they do. You love what right. you do. I do. And I, I love not only the creative process, but the hustle. Because, you know, it's always ecstatic when you write a song, but the second that song is written, you know, finalized, that's when the trouble begins. Who's going to demo it? How's it going to sound? Should we do a stripped down version or should we produce it all out because people have no imagination? Then they say, okay, we're doing the song. Then you find out that it's not on the list of the songs in the studio. And that happened to me with Aerosmith. I, I had written some songs with them and uh, Glenn Ballard was the producer. And so they had holed up at the Marlin Hotel for a few months, and it's not the way Aerosmith ever made music. So Glenn was had his magical synclavier and on all this, and and the band, you know, had nothing to do, and it was all like Stephen singing to tracks that Glenn was making, and Joe was kind of like, well, when do I play, and all this kind of stuff, and that went on for months. And so um, I had written two songs with them. You know, they, they snuck out and wrote a couple songs with me. One was called Hole in My Soul, and the other one was called Ain't That a Bitch. And uh, this is, these are songs that went on the Nine Lives record. So I was working over at Criteria uh, with Ricky Martin. We were doing a horn session, and I heard that Aerosmith was next door now doing drum overdubs to Glenn's tracks. Dude, was I involved with that Ricky Martin session? Because I vaguely remember hearing you bitch yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that. We, you were doing drums. Yeah, yeah. and you were saying, and oh, that, that, you know. You know yeah. So I decided, I, you know, the, the assistant engineer, who was a snitch, I told him, go in there and tell me what, what the songs are. Are those two songs on the list? And they weren't. So... I go in through the back way, you know, where the tapes are, you know, the whole back channel. I didn't go in the front way. I go in through the back and I made it into the studio. I go walk into the control room and they were all eating their like takeout and they were on their lunch break. And I look at the list and I said, hey, what happened to Hole in My Soul? And ain't that a bitch? And uh, then Glenn stepped forward. He said, well, you know, um, we've actually gone in a different direction. And I said, well, that's funny. The Rolling Stones haven't gone in a different direction for 35 years. <laughs> and that's, it seems to be working just fine. That's when I saw them all look at each other, like, what, what are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah, yeah. And um, pretty soon they were cutting with, with the guy that, that produced Silver Chair, and remember that guy that was deaf in one ear? Yeah. Up in New York. And guess what? Hole in my soul. And ain't that a bitch got cut. So, you know, it's sort of like, I don't know. It was kind of uh, this feeling like I wasn't going, going to be undone. You know, I, I, I worked hard on those demos and everything. And it was like, all of a sudden, they weren't going in that direction. It's like, what? And so. I, 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 I was sneaky. I went around the back. I got in there and I said just the right thing. Oh, dude, that was, you know, I saved it. Yeah. But there's so many times that I've written songs 
you know, and then I ask about what I think is like the epic song that's going to be the number one song of all time. It's not on the record. It's like, why? Uh, well, my, my boyfriend didn't like it. You know, or, uh, you know, my hairdresser thought I should go more in the dance direction, not rock. It's like, really? I mean, it's like, dude, anybody can say one thing and your song can get knocked out. Dude. But you have to fight all the time in this business to, to the hustle yeah. of making sure your song stays on. So of the 4,000 songs I've written, a thousand, let's say, got onto records, wow. made album tracks and all that. Of those, 80 ended up on the top 40. Of those 80, maybe 20 in the top 20. Of those 20, maybe 10 in the top five, or you know, maybe six or seven number ones. Uh, you know, so it took 4,000 songs to get, you know, like a handful, can't, you know, of number one records. That's brilliant. That's but but I never gave up and I, I was working and, you know, I had a great inspiration, which was Diane Warren because she was one of my best friends. She's a hustler too, but she is like a fierce rival. So if I, if I called her and she was, it was a Saturday. Oh, I'm in my office writing. Can I call you back? She's writing. Why am I not writing? If her lights are on, my lights have to be on. <laughs> and so Love it. that's why, you know, I, I've been kind of maniacal in terms of my work ethic. And, um, you know, that's why I've got a book called Living on a Prayer, Big Songs, Big Life, because it's been a big life of making it because I grew up very poor. Yeah. My mother was a songwriter. She was a kind of a, a kind of bohemian um, yeah. kind of lost person in a way but she always was working on her poems and her songs she worked at burger king during the day on the weekends she was always gone she was out there making her demos then that night she would go to nightclubs yeah. and uh try to get well, yeah. her songs with the artists that were, were that were singing and so she always said well you know someday we're going to live in a mansion on miami beach because we lived in liberty city in the projects and so eventually I came back to Miami. I bought four mansions and I gave her one. And I, I drove around in a little golf cart from one to the other. It was all within two blocks. And um, that's where we, you know, reinvented Latin music, you is, know, with that, Ricky Martin. Is that where the Gentleman's Club was? The Gentleman's Club studio, yeah. Mm, I never got to see that, but I got to. Now it can't be gentlemen's. It's got to be gentle persons. <laughs> gentle other people, other kinds of people. Gentle it? <laughs> gentle it. Gentle it club. <laughs> Dude. Okay, my, my first experience, I'll just jump right into this. Well, I was one of the craziest, most unique sessions, but such a music business session. And I'll tell it from my perspective, and I want to correct me if I do anything wrong, say anything wrong, but... I remember the Gentleman's Club because they was, you guys had maybe the first Pro Tools. Yes. Something about yes, like we cutting had, edge. We were one of the satellite Pro Tools studios. And I, you know, I decided to, to save space because I built my studio in this garage yeah, that yeah. was part of my house. But we, we made it look like an English Gentleman's Club, mm -hmm. you know, with library paintings. It had yeah. a fish tank and yeah. a leather couch. I mean, people would go in there and they never saw a studio that looked like that. Of course not. And so, um, so we were trying to miniaturize everything. And so then came these Mackie boards yep. and the Pro Tools. Yep. And well, we, then it was slow tools. Oh, dude. We'd have br breakdowns like, you know, <laughs> 19 of them a day. You know, I drove one of my artists crazy because we were breaking our teeth on it. Billy Myers, I, I think I gave her a nervous breakdown with these breakdowns. Uh, I was on that but, one too. <laughs> but I, I put it in my mind, you know, to make the ultimate, you know, millennium song from hell, Draco and I, and it would be all digital, part of the new millennium. Right. And so we created 
live in La Vida Loca, all in the box. In the box. Yeah, you know, all in the box. And it made it all the way to number one. Oh, yeah. And the Wall Street Journal, you know, made note of it, almost like Alexander Graham Bell. Yeah. Like we had done something completely, you know, unique and futuristic that had never been done before. And uh, last year, that recording, not only just the song, the recording and the performance, all of it, was inducted into the Library of Congress uh, National Registry of Recorded Music. Wow. Being the first. Would that be the first uh, Pro Tools or did Yes, you? to make it all the way. To one. To, went to one, yeah. Well, that unleashed the lion because next thing I get a call from Brian, says, eh, can you, can, can, are you available to record? It was, was it Right Track or Quad or wherever it was in New York? Uh, no, it wasn't quad i think it was right track anyway we're in new york and i sl i show up you know in my sweats i don't even know my shave I, you know it was just, i thought it was a drum overdub just me and i and 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 brian's there but then i'm seeing john cicada and george noriega from emilio's camp right maybe that's the fun. i'm like and brian says don't he stopped me before i even asked the question he says wow well, we're gonna do a couple of songs of theirs i'm like oh Am I playing? Yeah, you're going to play a ballad, and then uh, uh, John's going to sing. This is all I ever had, I think. Yeah. You played on that. And, and then you show up, and it's this, uh, and it, this, this, this some tension or something going on. I'm charting this song out. Now they're trying to get the files. This is what took time. From the Gentleman's Club, it stems through the internet there. And we get them up there, and it's, there's all kinds of technical issues. And they're on the phone, you know. Well, first of all, there was eight measures that, that wasn't on the demo that's now there. Second of all, they had mixed, like, the percussion. And I always ask, what are you keeping? Because i got to right. play with that. doesn't matter if I'm on the click. What do you keep? They're keeping the percussion. But when the horns came in in the bridge, it was like 8 billion decibel. And there wasn't a damn thing I could do because I got to hear the percussion. It's a Latin. So, right, right. So we're doing Shake Your Bon Bon, all right? So all of a sudden, so many people start rolling in. There's like about eight of them. Then Ricky shows up with his entourage from Miami. There's like 30 people in there for a drum overdub. My light goes, my head's going, do, 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 do. So my understanding is, ah. Living La Vida Loca is a huge hit, but there's no record. Tommy Matola is running Sony, and he's probably thinking, there's an opportunity here to make a lot of money. So I need songs. So instead of going with one guy, why don't we go with two guys or more and get them competing? Because they're going to be like, oh, I, you know, I can write one better than that. And... That's the understanding I was getting at that moment suddenly, was that this is more than just a drum over dub on Shake Your Bon Bon. Am I right? It was kind of like a, a you know, you know, love is a battlefield, kind of like, uh, yeah. like uh, you know, hits are a battlefield, you know, right? Hits are a battlefield, right. Hits are a battlefield. Uh, and um, there was a lot of, you know, like, you know, because... You got to realize that Emilio Stefan was the godfather of Latin music. Yeah. And he and Gloria created the first big crossover wave. Right. You know, a decade before. And, you know, he had developed John Cicada and, you know, continued developing artists. But when Ricky came along and we had the hit with The Cup of Life and then Live in La Vida Loca, he jumped in with his crowd and he was close with Tommy. And so then all of a sudden we were like competing camps. Yep. And the wild thing is that, for people who don't know, you and Emilio Estefan are both American Cubans. Yeah. In Miami. Yes. And both grew up poor. Yeah. How bizarre is that? Well, you know, now we're like best of friends. Of course. And, uh, you know, but in those days, it was, it was like... West Side Story? It was like West Side Story. <laughs> no, I mean, it was just like, okay, you know... I was stepping on his territory and he was stepping on mine. Right, right, right. right. And, um, you know, I, I think that we helped each other yeah. because that competition yeah. made us want to be better 
than 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 the next guy. And Matola knew that. <laughs> he, he was abs- smart. Absolutely. So so here's where I'm going. So we're trying and and the by the way, the click from that session was like it sounded like a cotton ball hitting the floor. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not gonna be able to hear that. And she, Elliot Shiner was the engineer, and I'm like, can you get another click up there? No. I'm like, oh my God. So here's what I'm thinking now. I suddenly turned into Kenny Kissinger. I'm <laughs> like, not Kenny Aaron, but Kenny Kissinger. I'm like, okay, you got Sony, you got Desmond, you got Emilio's people, you got Wiki. I said, I am not gonna play a note until I just crush it. I gotta have the mix just right. It's gonna be one take, will define everything. That's what I'm thinking. I gotta please the room, especially Ricky. Because if Ricky's happy, everyone will go like, so here we go. We do it, do a take, and there's Ricky with his hands on the glass, smiling. He's touching the glass from the control room, and he's happy. And it was almost like everyone went, ah, because at least, and I did more takes, but it was like, this is going to work. This is okay. Yeah. Everybody, I've never been in that position before, but it's it. But the reason why I tell that story is because that is an aspect of the music business that people don't, they don't see. They don't know about you going back to the, the fight for a song that somebody, you know, convinced the band that should be recording as a band in the studio and should be recording those songs. They don't know how your songs got pushed aside and all that work and all that effort, when it was really clear that those songs with Aerosmith is a touchdown, but somebody wiggles in there and does some weird... Well, I mean, Glenn Ballard at that moment had done Jagged Little Pill. Oh, well, he was the so guy. That's was, why they went to him. He was the god. He was the guy. He was the guy, and he was the god. Yeah. And in fact, I brought him to my studio and brought all of my guys around. I had 12 engineers and, and assistants and all that to ask him questions. How did you make that record? Brilliant. You know, and, Brilliant. and so he was very generous and, and very sweet to us. This is before he threw my songs off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he had a uh, jagged little pill in his head. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> So, you know, he told us how he had, you know, built those tracks and that Alanis was like improvising and that she was really genius. She wrote all the lyrics and all the melodies right. and he was playing like these chords, right? you know, and, it, and it's funny because he had also done Wilson Phillips. Oh yeah. So if you listen to Wilson Phillips and you listen to Alanis Morissette, you'll hear a lot of similar chord chord changes and all that, but the context was so different. And also the, the way that they did the guitars, you know, on Jagged Little Pill, that was like- Crunched it? They crunched, crunched it. it. Yeah, crunched. that was a movement. That was the, the beginning of a movement. Well, it, it never turned around. I mean, from that moment on, female uh, singer-songwriters, I mean, it was like, that was the standard. Absolutely. Because I did, I started getting into that world with Michelle Branch, uh, uh, Avril Lavigne, uh, Avril Lavigne especially. Yeah, yeah, Lauren Christie. You know, with um, the Matrix. Yeah. You know, very influenced by Jagged Little Pill, and they crushed it though. Yeah. With Avril Lavigne, I mean, really, it was like a, that was the new style. Then it kind of devolved into every Disney song and every Nickelodeon song with a girl on it oh, yeah. sounded like that yeah. as well. So then, you know, many other things happened, but that was a kind of strange moment, right? Yeah, totally. Oh yeah, because all of a sudden I'm playing on all these chicks records, but they want the grit. Uh, they want the grit, but they want that pretty voice there too. That but was- also the lyric content. Oh yeah. It wasn't like what Alanis was giving, yeah. which was so edgy. Yeah. You know, the stuff she was saying was outrageous. And the way she sang it. Yeah, too. but, the, you know, a Disney or, or a Nickelodeon star could not sing those kind of lyrics. Oh. So, you know, I, I, you know, I also was in there writing and producing for Hilary Duff and, um, you know, different artists. And then later on worked with American Idol artists. Right. Kate, um, Kelly Clarkson, I was one of her first producers, mm-hmm. and we had Carrie Underwood and Bo Bice, 
Oh, what? Fantasia and all of those kids, you know, and it was a certain kind of mainstream aesthetic that had to be maintained. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. You know, I mean, but Kelly went on to, you know, with Miss Independent and all these really edgy, cool songs. Yeah. You know, since you've been gone, she's all got of that this voice too, and she's got she had the voice, yeah. but she had the attitude, yeah. and she was a real rock singer. Yeah. So you know, and then of course Carrie Underwood, when I worked with her, and I we did her vocals because there was no money for the budget, you know, for these uh, showstopper records, yeah. you know. So I had her recording in my studio. So we both stood next to each other, you know, with headphones on, and she was singing uh, Independence Day and uh, by Martina McBride. Oh yeah. And she sang with so much heart and her energy. And she was like, I just felt I was in the presence of an angel, really. Like wow. she was exuding this thing. And I said, you know, because on the show, she was almost singing kind of almost Mariah Carey kind of stuff with riffs and everything, she, which she can do. These right. R&B riffs and everything. Right, right, right. I said, you sing, you know, this country music. So. Uh, what kind of music do you really want to do? And she said, I want to just do country music. I said, then only do country music. And I introduced her to my best friend, Mark Bright, who brought her, he was doing Rascal Flats. Right. And he brought her, um, you know, Jesus Take the Wheel and um, all of those, When He Cheats, all of those songs, and the rest is history. Well, yeah, she and she's the queen of country. I mean, she... I mean, there's her and Taylor Swift. I mean, it's right. Really, just she. Yeah, that was good. That was an interesting time too, because because of budgets and people weren't selling records like they it was starting to be where the budgets were going down. So it was like I felt from my angle, I was overdubbing last. It used to build the drums, build the, the thing on the drums. I was then doing the drums last. The end. At the end. Because then you don't have to be in that expensive room. You could, like you were saying, you can work in the gentleman's club, build all these tracks up. Yeah, and then we'd call you and you could yeah. do five songs in two I hours. Did, I did 13 in one day once. You know. Eight Alanis Moore set, it was for John Shanks at Henson, the big room, A room. Uh, it may have been an M back then, but yeah, because it was like, well, can you do this? Can you do this? I did like a Melissa Etheridge song to Anastasia, Eight Alanis set. Uh, something I think for Johnny Resnick, something for Gwen Stefani, a little this, a little that. And I had just flown from Philly, landed, did it, and then I had to take the red eye to do the TV show in New York. But, I mean, that's like five different artists who had to split one room, one day. And that's when I moved to LA. I went, okay, it's over. They're gonna be flying me all over the place for one song. Yeah. So I, I moved here. I, I, but there ain't no drum machine like Kenny Aronoff. Because you are a machine. I am a machine. Yes. I mean, just the most in-time drummer ever. Oh, I don't know. That, that plays so hard, yeah. you know, and means every beat. Oh, yeah. You put your heart and soul to every beat, I, every take, every time. And that's why there's no one like you. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm just wired that way. I mean, I just, I, there's no, there's no other way to do it. You know what I mean? And you're that guy as a producer, man. That's why I was saying what I was saying, man. You're so passionate about everything. It's like everything is, I mean, well, <laughs> when we were doing that meatloaf record, I didn't, I didn't know it was so intense for T, you and me. Now I've done a bunch of meatloaf records and I know how he can be. And um, there was one day I remember you going, you were just explaining something, and it wasn't like play this beat, this, but you were explaining it like theatrical. And I'm like, and I, I like that. I, I was like, I, it was up to me to figure out what you wanted. But the biggest thing that you were trying to convey, which was not happening, was this certain kind of energy and emotion. That's what's brilliant about you. Because, like I said, people are feeling creatures. It's all about emotion, it's all about feeling. I figure you figure. It's like, you figured out, Kenny, you're the drummer, but I want this emotion, right? Right. You're the drummer. I'm not a drummer, you're the drummer, I, but I want this kind of vibe. <laughs> Meatloaf comes in and goes, I want some Latin. And you went, what? 
the fuck are you talking about? I want some Latin. And you, Miko storming off, and um, I go into my, at that point I went, all right, this isn't good. I said, I'll, I'll give you Latin, not knowing what the hell he means. So I'll, I'll give you Latin. So all he wanted to do is know that somebody would give him Latin. So all I did was um, go, dude, God, God, just moved the snare to him over one thing and did a little dingy ding. He says, yeah, that's what I want. It wasn't Latin. But it didn't stay on the record either. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I probably didn't. There was no Latin on Bad Out of Hell 3. No. No. Well, that was the whole, that's why you react. It's like, are you kidding me? Latin on That was so off brand. Yeah. He, he, at that point, it was probably because you guys, he was just trying to test me. Yeah, and and I read in the chapter. I mean, he 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 kind of buried that record. He did. He was kind of like it was his way of correct me if I'm wrong, but it was his way of saying I don't need to work with Jim Steinman. I can do this myself. But at the same time, he was burying it. Like he he didn't want everybody. He felt guilty because you know he really should never have gotten into the you know, legal battles he did with Jim Steinman over the brand Bad right. Out of Hell. Right. Because all Jim wanted to do was call his musical Bad Out of Hell, and it was all a collection of his songs. Right. You know, and it took nothing away from, from Meatloaf. Me. From Meatloaf. And in fact, it built him up more. Right. But Meatloaf was saying, no, those that's the name of my trilogy, and that's the name of my brand, and you can't use it. And they got into a fight. So that's why Jim didn't, produced Bad Out of Hell right. 3. Right. So then they brought me in almost like I didn't realize that they didn't care about me. No, did they you just, know what you were walking into? No, I didn't. And I I was made to record seven Meatloaf songs, not Meatloaf songs, Jim Steinman songs that Meatloaf had never recorded that were on Jim Steinman's other projects, like It's All Coming Back to Me Now. Oh, yeah that he did with um, Celine Dion. Yeah. And so I, you know, I created a, a, a duet with Marion Raven from Norway. Oh, I, I did, what was M, M2M or, they were a band, Marion Raven and somebody had a band. Yeah. Right, so, um, you know, there were seven songs that were Jim Steinman songs. And some were from a vampire musical. Some of them were on Jim Steinman's solo album because, you know, Jim was holding back the, the real songs for Bad Out of Hell 3 and wasn't giving them because he wasn't going to give them until he got what he wanted, right? And you didn't know and, anything. You no. were figuring so, it out. So I put songwriting camps together to come, come up with great songs. So I, that's when I first wrote with Marty Fredrickson. Mm, yeah. And we wrote a song called If God Could Talk. Great title. So then uh, Meatloaf insists that, you know, my, my, one of my idols, Todd Rundgren, come in and, um, and do the background vocals on like a few songs, and that was one of them. And you see, I go way back with Todd because I was the coffee boy at Bearsville Studios when I was 17. Really? Yeah. But, you know, and he was never nice. No. So, uh, so I'd go, I'd sneak into the airlock, you know, Studio A. Yeah. Right. There was this airlock. Yeah. And he couldn't see me, so I'd go on my hands and knees to hear what he was doing. He was creating the you epic see, album, yeah. something, anything. He was mixing it. So as soon as the music would stop, I'd crawl out and I'd go to the right, and then he'd come out and he'd go to the left where the bathrooms were, you know. And you know, if you, if you know Bears, well, you yeah. went to the right. And then you made another right. That's where the phone was. Yeah. Right? I remember that. The pay phone. So when he came in to work with me, I was still the coffee boy. So he says to me, he says, you know, this song should, shouldn't be called If God Could Talk. It's If God Would Talk. Because everybody knows God can talk. And I shot back. I said, you know, he hasn't said a peep since the burning bush. <laughs> he didn't think that was funny. And of course, I didn't let him change the title of the of song not. because it's a coined phrase. If these walls could, could talk, talk and not if these walls would talk, talk. <laughs> you know, he wasn't getting the irony getting of, uh, of, the, of the hook, Yeah, you know, <laughs> and that's what I mean. I love writing uh, titles that have 
opposites. Yeah. And so it was like the tension of the opposites. Yeah. I, yeah, he's a very talented, but interesting guy. Yeah. So, um, you know, in the end, the, that album uh, was over $2 million. Took nine months to make. Also because the songs were eight minutes long. Yeah. And none of the sections repeated. So it's Trust like... Me, but I, my charts would be like around the whole drum set. And, and when I did the Bad Hour Hell 2, I remember, you know, Jim would say on, let's say on Tuesday, he'd say, hey, you know that drum part you played on Monday? Or on Thursday, he'd say, you know that drum part you played on Monday? Oh, yeah. I'd crossed it out and dated it. I would date Phil's. So if he, won, if he, could, he could remember. That thing you did on Monday, I'd go, yeah, I got it here. It's like five Phil's ago. It was like, wow. And I was going like, oh. you guys are wasting your money. No one's going to play a 10-minute song on the radio or an eight-minute or you know, they want it, It's what he wanted, you know, and I was trying to please him the whole time. And so then it really hurt my feelings when he went into an article and said, Bad Out of Hell 3 doesn't exist. And he actually took it down from Spotify. You can't find it on the U.S. Spotify, but because he owns, you know, his and his estate owns the rights to Bad Out of Hell three in the US mm. and then global was the main record company. So if you go to Europe, you can get it on Spotify there. And so I'm hoping some day that they'll come to their, their senses and realize that the fans want to hear bad out of hell three. I got that one. Of the, I got that record around here somewhere. That's, you know, bad out of hell, wait, it was somewhere. Uh, anyway. Yeah. And there are, sold, though. there sell. are seven Jim Steinman songs on it. Yeah. And, you know, they didn't put my name on the back of the cover, which was in my contract. They also didn't pay me my back end, which was $65,000. In the book, I saw that. You know, it was like really hard for me, nine months to be out of, the, out of work and then not get the back end. You know, I lost a lot of money, yeah. you know, because just keeping my operation going, yeah. trying to get the record. And I couldn't pull out because I put so much into it. And, you know, my manager was saying, just walk away. Just, you know, step over the body, move on. I said, can't do that. I have to finish Bad Out of Hell 3. It was like the holy grail to me. And then I wasn't appreciated for all the hard work and sacrifice that I made. I didn't see my children. They were toddlers. Yeah. And, um, you know, it wasn't, I Almost never got a thank year. you. I never got a thank you. Ugh. Well, I mean, you yeah, walked so, into something you had no and, idea. And by the way, if, if people are lucky enough to get their hands on it, listen to it from beginning to end. He never sang better. He never sounded better. And the songs were, especially like that song, Blind as a Bat, that James Michael had come up with and I helped yeah, him finish. That's great. It's a masterpiece. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm hoping that um, in time people will see it. You know, one of the things that I never got to tell Meatloaf was that all those seven songs of his that we cut, I ran them past Jim. I sent him the rough mixes. Wow. I wanted his approval and his advice if yeah. I wasn't doing it right. But he always loved every note and said, thank you so much. That's fantastic. He was encouraging. So behind the scenes, you know, I was making nice with him, but for real, I wanted to, I didn't want to disappoint him yeah. with his own music. So, so I never got a chance to tell Meatloaf before he passed that that was happening. And then I find out that he's like made the album not existent. And then he made an album with Jim finally when they made up and all that, which is really to me the coda of the trilogy. And, and the two of them are on the cover and they're sort of walking into this hell's fire yeah. or something, you know, I, in the end, I have a lot of affection for him because he was a great teacher. You know, he taught me a lot about myself. And um, he also was, you know, a national treasure. People don't all realize that. You know, someone like Meatloaf is up there with Janis Joplin, with Jimi Hendrix, with, you know, like the icons of yeah. American music. And so, you know, I, you know, low, a deep low bow to, you know, Michael Lee a day. 
otherwise known as meatloaf. Meatloaf. Man, that's, well, I feel fortunate I was part of it. All I knew is, you know, I came and played the drum tracks and left. So I, you know, you're there for nine months. I'm there for nine minutes, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like a whole nother. Yeah, but that's the thing, you know, my, you know, with, with me, it's like, I always strive for perfection. Oh, that's And for sure. I was known as a difficult person and I don't see myself as difficult. I'm demanding, but I, people, are better because of it. You know, I, I'm not mean to That's people. That's why you're hired. You know? Hired. You're hired to deliver. Hired to deliver for them. Yes. You know, for the money that they're paying me. Yes. This and was so, that. you know, sometimes what happens between a producer and an artist is it's called transference. So they transfer all their parental issues onto the producer. You know, I can be the mother or the father somebody they have a problem with, and then all of a sudden something I say could touch off that transference issue. So then you have to work it out with them because in a way that's how they get to complete the cycle for themselves. And, but it takes a lot out of you. You're the therapist. Therapist that needs a therapist, <laughs> you know, because, yeah. you know, Meatloaf sent me to Al-Anon you know, to learn how to deal with, you know. Oh, with anger and... Uh, with difficult people. So you did learn a lot. I, le I did. Diane Warren took me, yeah. uh, and I started going on Saturdays. And um, it, was, it was amazing, you know, just to get some skills. And once I started getting some skills and, you know, creating boundaries, then all of a sudden he started treating me better. Oh, interesting. He backed off. This was during the session, the, the project. During the project, wow. yeah. And then we, you know, I convinced him finally to get voice lessons from Eric Vitro, the oh, yeah, yeah. voice coach to the stars. And all of a sudden we had to record all the vocals all over again because he was singing so much better. Did you go? Did you, That's why the record took so long. Did, oh, yeah. And, and did you have to go syllable by syllable with him? He's famous. No, no, I, no. I mean, we did that in post. He would sing, you know, through, uh, but, you know, there were a lot of takes. There were a lot of takes. A lot of takes. When I was doing a bad, bad on a hell, that was the Village Recorder? Yes. Yeah. B village Recorder. I remember that. So when I did Bad on a too, um, it was, Roy Bitten was the piano player, uh, and Steinman was producing, and Tim Pierce was playing, and, and uh, me, well, I, something about me wanted to sing in the vocal booth. It was in the East West Studios at Oceanway, then the big room. And boy says, You're not gonna get a take, so what's the why bother? Oh, meat went, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And did they get takes? No, didn't even get that far. So meat and him are going after finally Roy just slams the piano down and walks out that way. Meat takes off from the vocal booth down the hall that way to meet him. And I'm in there, I'm like, I'm looking at the, the bass player goes on tour and says, what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen? I mean, boy, is this big, meets this big. And all of a sudden I hear all this crashing and stuff. I'm like, dude, should we jump out there and break them apart? She's, it'll be all right. Roy, uh, a meatloaf, Roy takes off, he's gone. Meatloaf comes in, his hair is like, like a, a, doc, a mad doctor. He's pacing around, around the room. He stops, he gets to me, goes something like, man, I'm sorry. And then he keeps pacing and pacing. But oh, before he went out there, he went, yeah. oh, fuck with me. And his hair was out there. So I was like, oh my God, what's uh, going on? I, I saw some of that. Did you catch some of that? Yeah. Me love, I love you. I love you. But that was just, that, that's what happened. One day he like kicked down the baffles, the microphone stand, everything, and just walked out. Went crazy, yeah. Went crazy. Yeah. And he was, wasn't mad at us. He was mad at himself. Yeah, yeah. You know, and frustrated. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, I was patient. I said, no, come on. Let's try again. Yeah. One more time. Yeah. You know, just do it one more time. You know, like 20. 20 times. 20, 20 times, times 10, times 15. Just one more time. Yeah. And then he'd, he'd go, Fuck you and the horse you rode in on. Yeah. You know? Well, that's, that's, that's light. <laughs> that was loving. <laughs> yeah, that was loving. Anyway. Oh, man. 
So this book, um, all those stories are in here. Yeah, that that yeah, that's so. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna read. It's an easy read. Did you have a publishing deal before you wrote it? Or you no, you were writing it, and then no, you I got a publishing. I no, I I self published it, and I got the help of Radius Books, which is uh, helps independent, um, you know, publishers like yeah. myself to get the book together. They did an extraordinary job helping me put it together. And, you know, I could never find a book deal because everyone said nobody cares what the life of a songwriter. Oh, dude, it's and, funny. You know, that doesn't sell. You know, it's like if I was a celebrity, maybe. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, they also didn't want to give me advances. They didn't want to commit to a, a publicity budget or a yeah. promotion budget. They wanted to own the book for 10 years. And they their profit was seventy five percent to my oh, yeah. twenty five. Oh yeah. And it's like, I'm not going to do that if I have to pay for everything anyway. Yeah. So it's worked out completely great, and I work with Rogers and Cowan, and uh, the team there um, as to do, doing PR. You're putting it into marketing. And, and hey, they got me here. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, we got we here. <laughs> we don't need them. <laughs> Yeah. Dude, tell me, like, um, it's probably in the book, but um, I mean, you know, the quote, the quote that, uh, you know, Steven Tyler said, I mean, you know, dude like a lady. I mean, what, what a great concept. And how did that, t tell that story. Well, um, this legendary A&R man, John Claudner. Yeah. He um, had hired me to work with Cher because he loved the work I did with Bon Jovi. And we actually, you know, gave her a song, We All Sleep Alone, and, and John and Richie and I produced it, and then Richie and Cher, and you know. Oh yeah, Richie. Yeah, right, Rich, Richie and Cher. Cher. Right, so um, then he had Aerosmith, and they had made a first album on Geffen after they had come back together called Done With Mirrors. And it wasn't commercially, you know, that successful. So he had seen what, you know, I'd been doing with Kiss and Bon Jovi. And so, you know, he, he, he forced me on them. So I go to Boston, car picks me up, takes me to this big warehouse, like an airplane hangar with doors that were like 40 feet high. And, you know, like kind of, you know, that roll open, you know, kind of like movie set kind of yeah. thing. And they had set up their whole touring stage there. Oh. And on the floor, there were, you know, rows upon rows, like an army of guitars. Every kind of Fender, Gibson, specialty brands, um, acoustic guitars, you know, banjos, just, you know, sparkles, zebras, tigers, <laughs> purple, glitter. I mean, every kind of yeah. guitar you could ever imagine. So uh, the door opens and I'm walking in in, in this beam of light into the, into the, the room. And Steven kind of comes towards me and is all lit by this light and a big smile on his face, very welcoming. And he said, come with me. I still hadn't said hello, nothing. So they were working on the side of the stage with the sound man and Joe had been uh, taping this backward guitar that was going a da 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 -da, they were like putting it backwards. Why? And then Stephen started singing, cruising for the ladies, da -da, da -da, cruising for the ladies. And then they stopped and they said, what do you think about that? It wasn't like, hello, Desmond, this is Joe. No, nothing. What do you think about that? And I took a shot. I said, I think that's really bad. This is your opening line to Joe. Yeah. I think that's really bad. Uh, I mean, I don't, and then I threw in just to see if I get a rise or a laugh out of them. I don't think Van Halen would put that on the B side of their worst record. Yeah. Great. You know, I mean, like, what is that? Like top down cruising for the ladies. Yeah. I mean, these guys were like mature guys. Like, yeah. what are you on sunset? What are you in 17 years you know, old, just out of high school? <laughs> you know, so, um, then Steven, you know, then Joe like crossed his arms and like, head back, you know, looking at me sideways. Then Stephen, you know, who's more of a people pleaser, like was said, well, originally I was singing, dude looks like a lady. And I said, dude looks like a lady. 
what? That's a hit title. Huge, huge. And so, and Joe said, we don't know what that means. And, you know, I said, well, I, I know what that means. He said, well, we don't want to um, offend the gay community. And I said, I'm gay. No, taking no offense here. <laughs> Tell me how you came up with Dude Looks Like a Lady. And Stephen went on to explain that they had gone to this bar on the shore, yeah. you know, the Cape Cod. Yeah, right. And with the, all the roadies and all, it was like this lonely bar, uh, empty, you know, bar. And at the end of the bar was this like vision of loveliness, like this platinum mullet yeah, with yeah. Uh, black nails and porcelain skin and yeah. curvy figure. And, um, you know, they were all like well, drawing straws. Who was going to go up and say hello, right? Yeah. So she turns and it's Vince Neal of Motley Crue. And then Steven said, ooh, that dude looks like a lady. That dude looks like a lady. Dude looks like a lady. And that was the birth of Dude Looks Like a Lady. That's awesome. Oh, man. So I talked them into going, you know, cruised into a bar on the shore. Right. Her picture graced the grime on the door. Right. And then Steven threw in this weirdo line that makes no sense even to this day. Because the whole premise was that, you know, he goes into this bar and, and falls in love with the stripper, but then she pulls out a gun and tries to blow him away, right? You know, right? But he threw in this line, she was a long lost love at first bite. And it's like, he knew her? Yeah, it's like, where's the surprise? A, where's the surprise element? Yeah. But he insisted on that. My line was like, I threw some, I, I threw some money down on this. Uh, I threw some twenties down on the stage or something like yeah. that, you know, like you do with strippers. Right. And, uh, he hated that. And, um, you know, like to this day said, I hated that line. It's like, okay, but your yeah. line blows yeah. the whole story. Well, yeah, he blows the whole story. Long lost love at first bite, da, 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 but I uh, may be wrong. You may be, she may be wrong, but you know, it's all right. You know, it's like something like that. Yeah. Like brought in the wrong and right. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Uh, then the second verse goes, never judge a book by its cover or who you're going to love by your lover, which to me is like the epic statement of all time, because look at us 37 years later, and we're talking about this. You know, who's, you know, binary, non-binary, uh, trans, uh, identify with this, identify, don't want to be pegged as anything, uh, you know, and um, I, it's, it's like the whole premise of the song is like, if you like what it looks like, go for it. Yeah, yeah. So then later he sings, my funky lady, I like it, like it, like it, like that. So. He doesn't run away. He stays. He stays. He stays. So it's all good. He likes what he likes. He likes what he likes. So that was sort of, you know, it was in Mrs. Doubtfire. She did yeah. the broom dance to yeah. it. Like every little kid in the world, you know, knows that song. Yeah. Right. You know, now looking back on it, do you see how like forward it was? And that song still stands to today. I know. Well, of course, they weren't thinking what was going to be coming. It's just that kind of just lands perfectly into the scenario. Well, yeah. also because when he was singing it and the way he was singing it, yeah. you thought he was singing about himself. Yeah. You know, because he kind of looks like yeah, a lady. exactly. With the big lips it's and the hair, uh, all the hair. Skinny and, and the black uh, little, like, I always noticed his nails were like painted, but they were painted like just a little stripe. So they look like claws. Yeah. You know, just one little black stripe. Yeah. They like, eh, yeah. you're right. And so, um, you know, and all those scarves and, and, and eyeliner and all of that. And it's like the song caught on and it brought their band back to life. But that's because it was real. Yeah. We went from cruising for the ladies. It's like, you're going to be cruising for the ladies? Dudes, you're all married. Yeah. It's Not like to mention, that's something you guys would have written way earlier in your career. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and and at that point, you had to do something to grab people's attention. Oh yeah. And John Claudner was a great sport because he wore a 
bridal dress in the video with the long beard. It was him. That was John Clotner. Oh my God. That's yeah. Insane. So he was a good sport on that. And, um, well, he's thinking like, whatever, make money. But that's, you know, then I went on the, you know, the next day, um, Joe didn't show up, you know, after that day. And Stephen and I wrote Angel. The next day? The next day. Joe, Joe isn't on that song. He didn't show up. And so uh, oh. Stephen and I sat next to each Did other. Did you play on the piano? On a little Wurlitzer that was, on, you know, the oh. back was to the stage, like the mic and the scarves and all that was up here. And I, you know, I said, tell me about your life. And he said, well, you know, I, I went through a lot, you know, getting um, clean. And um, I met this incredible woman, Teresa. And, you know, he married her. And she's, he said, you know, she's, she's an angel. She's my angel, you know? And um, so when he said the word angel, those lips sound, looked a little bit like Jagger saying Angie. You know, Angel, right. Angie, those big yeah, 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 liver yeah, lips, yeah, yeah. right? And I said, oh, I've got to write a song where he says Angel like a million times <laughs> so I can keep seeing those liver lips. <laughs> That's hilarious. And that became a hit for them as well. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, it was like, it's not sitting down and saying, let's, what could be a hit? If you think about that, it's like riding a bike and thinking about it. You just fall over. Yeah. You know, you just go and you, you're in the moment and you're having fun and you're bringing something to life. And, and, you know, the next day, um, Steven didn't show up, but Joe did. And we wrote hearts done time. Jeez. I mean, it was like one after the other. So you, you don't, you aren't thinking about it. You aren't thinking about it. I never, I never think about that. You never do? No, no. Can't. You just try to make the the best moment. What is a hit? What's on the radio today? Yeah, I know. What. That was recorded two years ago? Yeah. And then if you chase that, you're, well, by the time your song comes out, it's four years you're behind late, the time. Especially today. Yeah, no. You have to go. This is why I go with the story. What is the story? Right. And the music is the scoring to the script which are the lyrics and the, that pay off the title. So do, when you write songs, did you typically write, you're looking for lyrics in the story first, even if you're singing at a yes. piano or a guitar. But you, No, I mean, that's after. Right. You know, you're okay. sitting there, okay, let's, let's write a bunch of titles and let's pick the best title to write. And everybody goes around the room and they look through their things yeah. and they throw the title on the table. Right. You know, and that do I, do I, do we one of those guys that write things down, jot things down. I I in the book. No, not so much like that. Now I'm just like song title. But back I put, in the old days. No, in the old days, yeah, maybe a little bit. Well, when I first I thought of "You Give Love a Bad Name," I wrote it down on a piece of paper. I folded it and put it in my back pocket. So I, when I met John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora, that's the first thing I pulled out. Right. And John had just met me, and all of a sudden, when I said the title, his face lit up. I never saw so many teeth. <laughs> and, um, you know, he threw down Shot Through the Heart, because he had a song called Shot Through the Heart uh, from Shot previous. Shot Through the Heart, you know, uh, and then it's, uh, I'm a bad name. Yeah, Shot Through the Heart, and you're to blame, darling. You give love a bad yeah, name. And bad. that's when the three of us had our first, you know, three-way fist bump in the, in the air. And we wrote that song really fast. It just all flowed out. And I later found out that they never had an intention of writing a song with me for Bon Jovi. They wanted to write songs that maybe I could get cuts on uh, so that could bring money to them so that they could keep going with their band. Oh, it wasn't going to be for Bon Jovi. No. It's like song. Yeah, but the song turned out so good they kept it. And then we kept writing. We wrote Living on a Prayer and, you know, like all those songs. Bad Medicine. Yeah. Yeah. Bad Medicine was oh, for New Jersey. Bad Medicine. Yeah. Where did so, that title come from? John had it. I mean, they had started the song. Yeah. You know, and also because he had bad name, he loved the word bad. Yeah. Because the way he said it almost sounded like a P instead of like bad. It's like pad. 
Oh. You, know, you give love a bad name, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And that that resonated with with so, him. with Bon Jovi. So I, I I walked in. They had already started the song, and I suggested the lift that was the B section. Oh yeah. You know that's what you get when you fall in love. Da, 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 da. You know, it's like modulates. Modulate, yeah. So instead of being this like linear song, like bluesy song, it had this pop element that put the song over. Wait, and living on prayer, it modulates too. Yes, yes. Whoa, and it has that bar of three. Da, 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 da. Whoa, on prayer. Is that? Yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, but when we when the we song is wrote, done, when we and then is that when we first wrote it before the modulation, there was a drum fill. Yeah. And you, when I heard the demo, I said, guys, that almost sounds like one of those Barry Manilow lifts, you know, the drum fill, but like, well, we're gonna make it, you know, it's like sounded well, like, you know, too. it was like that. So I suggested, like, why don't you go, uh, all that we got, oh, there was this, it. so there's a bar of three. Yeah, you cut one note off. It sounds one, like but one beat, yeah. one beat off. One beat. And it made all the difference well, in the world because, because it made the modulation not sound corny. And it creates tension too. It's it was exciting. Yeah. It the, makes the, the jump push forward. becomes the yeah. downbeat. Yeah. But you know, I've heard I've heard that John has recently started saying that he curses me for the modulation. Well, of course. <laughs> now because <laughs> of course cause, he does. Because it's, too, cause it's so that. high. Somebody was just talking and said that says, why did I, oh, Ann Wilson. I just spoke to Ann Wilson. I had her on the show and she says, because I asked her, are you still singing things in the same keys? She says, oh my God. Yeah, I mean, you know, mostly, but she says, wow, what was I thinking back then? She wasn't projecting that she'd be doing it at age X, X, X. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, dude, you dude, know, dude, dude. This felt like a jailhouse confession. I've said things in, we, this, we have, this, in, in this interview that I, I didn't even put in the book. Well, you dude, know, I so. left out the juicy stuff, <laughs> but we can't talk about that. So thank you so much. And yes, uh, so love you so much. And, you know, I, you're my idol. I mean, no. there's no one that can play drums like you ever in existence and i'm so grateful for what you contributed to the songs that that we did together thank you so much oh man dude you rock dude i your sessions were always the most exciting and i just you were such a great team leader and you motivate everybody you motivate you excite oh. everybody that's your gift is passion love and joy Bing, that's it thank you so much <laughs>